day to pick up mail, and we're planning mm -hmm. to come in. Gwen, me, uh, Brett, Sally, David, Blake, Christopher, Jeff, Free, Alan, Brad, and Colin. Who did I miss? Sounds good. I'm just missing Tina and Rhonda. And it's uh, after time to start, so uh, perhaps that's what we should do. Um, there is a, a script that the community board has given us to talk a little bit about uh, how to run a meeting. And, and, how, and I'm not sure I want to read it because you've all been on community board meetings before and you know that you're going to stay mute uh, until you speak and knock out all the unnecessary background noise. And you also know the routine of any particular committee like ours, which is to have uh, Highline, in this case, make their presentation for the committee to ask questions and for um, uh, the public then if they have questions and if Janine can find them, which I think she probably can. Uh, yep. I'm, you can I'm, just raise your virtual hands and I can, I'll find you. <laughs> And, and to raise your virtual hand, you have to hover on the bottom of your screen to get participants up. And underneath participants, you have the raise hand function. Um, uh, I'm, I'm Martin Decat, co-chair with uh, Jeffrey, uh, who is the other co-chair of this. And I think the guiding light of our organization. Thank you, sir. Um, we have this discussion, he and I, every time who's, who's going to take the chair. I have a, I'm sitting on a chair, but this is the virtual chair, and I'm not going to waste any more of your time. I'm going to put the highlight up. Um, well, hello, I'm, I'm Robert Hammond. I'm one of the co-founders and uh, executive director of the Highline. Just want to also acknowledge some of the um, our my other colleagues that are on. Um, Gail Beltrone is our COO. Um, Maurizio Garcia, who's our uh, chief programming officer, and uh, Maritza, who you know, who Maritza, I don't know your full title, but as guru to all of us. So um, thank you all for, for uh, having us. And, um, you know, uh, as many of you all know, um, you know, this, the Highline started at the CB4 meeting. <laughs> um, thanks to Ed Kirkland, who, who Josh and I had both reached out to separately about the Highline. And he told us to come to a meeting at Penn South. And it was August um, 1999, so we're coming up on 21 years. So thank you all. And you know, all of our first meetings, everything was really through CB4. So thank you all for that. Um, and I think most of you all know we closed uh, on March 16th. Um, the Highline is a tight <laughs> place that is known for its crowds. And we just didn't feel that it could be um, safe to remain open. So with the city, we, we closed the High Line then. Um, and for these reasons, we've also decided to postpone our public programs for the remainder of the year, probably not surprising. We'll try to do most of them next year. For example, all the art that was gonna happen this year is gonna happen next year. Um, I'm luckily right now I'm sitting uh, at the High Line offices. I can show you there's the High Line <laughs> live. Um, it's doing great. Um, we're, it's, and I think we have some photos, but I mean, we don't have to show them, but if, if people are interested, we have some sort of photos of what it looks um, like now. Um, our gardeners uh, were originally in the essential worker category, so we're not allowed up there. They just started going up there about a week and a half ago. And, um, but we, we were closed. Luckily, it was a very wet, cold um, spring. So most of the plantings are in, in, in pretty good shape. And I, you know, it was, I was just saying it was, uh, it's, it's beautiful up there, but it's also sad. Um, I think why the Highline is successful is it's the combination of the planting, the city and people, and you sort of need all three. And right now you have the city and planting, but no people. So it's sort of not quite working. Um, our staff have been working from home. Um, We've continued to do remote learning through our schools program with um, James Waldman School, Quest to Learn, and PS41 shifting to virtual. We've also continued to employ 20 youth in our team program. 
um, working uh, virtually. They're paid um, $15 an hour and participate in skill building activities. You've probably heard about that. Um, and they're going to continue through uh, the end of the term, which is August 16th, and we'll hope to do another cohort, cohort of teens afterwards and even seeing if we can expand that a little bit. Um, and then we've uh, we partnered with Speaker Johnson Office and IEC and Fresh Direct to help support um, fresh food boxes to neighbors in need. And we had a lot of our staff and volunteers um, participate um, with y'all in, in reaching out to neighbors to make sure they're um, we're okay and continue to make those calls. And we just started working um, with uh, Brad Hoylman's office to do a kosher meal delivery. Um, we've done help with hot meals from local restaurants to the FD and YMS. And, you know, we're one of so many others that are helping with this. So we're, we're a small part in these efforts. And I know y'all have, a lot of y'all have been really integral to those. So thank y'all. Um, but like a lot of organizations, we are obviously having a fi financial hardship. Um, we were able to get CARES funding, which was great, which was in enabled us to keep um, all staff on full um, salary um, through the end of, oh yeah. So we can just click through. I think there are just some photos. Um, yeah, just this closing. Oh, this was nice. We were mentioning an article about things people miss. Um, I, we were before hugs. I personally miss hugs more than the High Line, but I do miss the High Line. Next. Oh, that's me on the High Line. <laughs> um, Pep have been up here. Um, we haven't had any problems. No, um, no vandalism. Very few. No one really sneaking up on the High Line. Not, no, no problems at all on that front. Next. Uh, one down tree that was in a in in the wind. Um, it was actually a tree that we were probably going to have to remove anyway. Um, next, so you can see the planting coming up through the grading. So this was on May seventh. Um, it's one of the few places you can actually see something that's you. Most of y'all would notice the difference because we didn't finish cutback. But if you'd never been to the Highline, I don't even know if you would notice that many the differences. Um, next. And so you can see normally that would have been cut back that dead planting, but we didn't finish it. And we're going to leave it. It actually looks um, really nice and sort of sort of a, a memory of, of this time and what happened next. And these are some gardeners back up at work. This this was taken um, just recently. Next. Yeah, and I don't if you can see the lawn has really high grasses and it re, it seeded itself. Um, we're sort of uh, one of the things I mean we could talk to you all about is do we do we cut it and have it people can go on it or do we leave it sort of beautiful like that? So they're not going to listen no matter what, Robert. Already, so it, it wouldn't really matter. Okay, um, I guess. Okay. <laughs> um, next, I think that might have been. Oh yeah, this is just you know our school just. Remind me about the school program. Next, um, uh, these are this is the current cohort. Uh, actually, that's an old co cohort of teens. That's not our current one. Next, uh, you know, there's Eric Botcher who helped us, who was helped coordinating the delivery. Next, and and uh, the FDNY, which you know y'all know is right underneath the High Line at Twenty Third Street. Next. Um, and so, um, but we did have to do um, uh, cuts. We've unfortunately had to lay off about 15% of our staff. That's about 17 layoffs and five furloughs who we hope to bring back who were really valued members of our team. Um, we also did expense reductions, salary reductions. Um, and, you know, we're still projecting, we were a, a hefty deficit, and I'll, I'll, we'll talk about sort of opening next. Um, and that's really what we wanted to mainly talk to you about. Um, you know, our, 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 our priority right now is how can we open the High Line as soon as possible, but make sure it's safe. Um, and so many of you all know, we're, the High Line is actually owned by the city of New York. We operate the High Line under the jurisdiction of the Parks Department and follow all of their protocols. So. The High Line was actually the only park 
that was or has been closed because we are technically a building um, and have a fire code capacity and limited exits. And so that's why, so we're not really waiting. Our issue is not the governor's, it's really working with the city. Um, and so they're helping us come up with what are the, the guidelines? How are we gonna have social distancing on the High Line? Um, and we don't have all the details. Um, we're still working on that, but I think it's very likely we're gonna have to limit the number of people on the High Line, not surprisingly. Um, and looking at how to do that, because we obviously have over a dozen entries. And so I think we're probably, I won't be surprised if we have to limit um, entries um, and have a lot of them be exit only. Um, and one of the, the difficulties and things that's tricky is we're gonna have to man all those um, exits because they're all important for fire code capacity. So that's one of the things we're struggling with from a financial impact is even if we have left people up there, it's going to cost us a lot more um, to to operate. Um, uh, we're and we're looking. We don't have an exact number of what what's the right number of people under there. We're doing a lot of sort of analysis, looking at other parks, looking at other spaces that have reopened. I mean, some of the other things we you know, and again, sadly, it's a lot of things we don't know. We don't know how many people are going to come. We're obviously going to have less tourists, but we think more New Yorkers are going to want to come. That's what other um, parks have seen. Um, we're not going to have food vendors on the High Line or our retail shop. We hope to bring the food vendors back um, next year. Um, so what else am I missing? Um, mm -mm -mm. I think we'll want to come back to you as soon as we know. And, and I guess part of what we wanted to do here is hear what would what would y'all like? Um, so some of the other things we're looking at is how do we, you know, work with our partners, whatever the changes of operating the Highline, we need to be able to communicate those. And so that's something that will be really important um, working with you, but partners like Penn South, Hudson Guild, Chelsea Elliott, Fulton Tenet Associations, the Center, um, and inviting people back. Um, and, you know, one of the things we're trying to figure out is how can we prioritize our local neighbors, but still have it you know, we're, we're also a public park. Um, and so I think those are most of the things that I know um, right now. Um, some of the good news is that it will, if we're maintaining social distancing and limiting the number of people, it's gonna be less crowded. And I think mostly New Yorkers and I think a lot of locals. So I think that's something really, um, I think we're excited about. Um, and yeah, we'd love to sort of hear from you, um, you know, what you'd like to see. I, again, I don't, I don't know what we're actually gonna be able to do on that. Um, you know, what you would like when we open, what are the things that would be helpful? How, how is it important that we communicate? Um, and we just really wanted to have this dialogue. We really respect, you know, y'all's guidance. And I feel like we've always, y'all have always been helpful in, in, in being, um, probably our, our, our best source of what what people in the neighborhood think. So um, I'll ask uh, any of my colleagues, I'm sure I missed something, anything y'all wanted to make sure I hit on? Okay, I, that, hopefully that's good news. Do you, do you, so um, what's next in terms of format? Well, I, I think next is uh, for anybody who has questions to have them and we'll start the presentation. Um, somebody's got some noise going on in the background. Be careful with that, please. Alan has his hand raised. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, everybody from the High Line. Um, you do, you guys do, a, <clears throat> excuse me, wonderful job. So I was thinking, as you were speaking about um, access, and as you mentioned, you, you know, you're probably going to have to limit uh, how many people get up there. And um, my experience from going to the opera, um, I forget when it was, was it last year or early, I guess it was last year sometime, right? Maritza, um, I think uh, her staff did a wonderful job in um, ferreting people through the whole process down in there. So for most people, 
um, in the neighborhood, going to the High Line is a spur of the moment thing. For a lot of people, though, if they're not that close to it, maybe they think, well, let's go on a Saturday or let's go on a Sunday or the weather's going to be nice. So maybe a combination of things such as that, such as what you did with the High Line in terms of ticketing somehow and, you know, you come in a certain time and blah, blah, and you do, you know, your, your walkthrough and, your, you know, and whatever it is. And then depending on what, what the crowd is, there might be people downstairs that, you know, you can let in as, as they come through. Um, so, I, you know, I guess that was the only thing really. I thought, I thought the ticketing um, uh, aspect of, of, of the opera worked out perfectly. Um, the lines moved quickly. Uh, people uh, were very, I think, were very happy. Again, but if you're online, you know, you got to spread it out. You got to make sure you got enough room up and down the street. <laughs> to put, yeah. But um, and my, that would be my, my suggestion. So thank you very Great. much. That's helpful. And I see, I see a question, or I don't know if I, as I see a question on the side about elevators, I can answer if you want. Go ahead, answer that, and then we'll go to Sally. Okay. Um, so, Kit, yes, that's important, and that's one of the things we're looking at is how do we make sure, and, and how do we, um, I mean, I think one of the things we're looking at is if, if we're not allowing entry in every um, entry, but we, we would allow entry in eleva every elevator. That's something that we've talked about to make sure it's ex as accessible as possible. Um, all of our elevators are working except right now uh, 16th Street. Is that right, Gail? Correct, correct. And the update on that is? So we've actually had a couple of different conversations with parks. This elevator is going to need to undergo a significant redesign because essentially it is not watertight. Every time it rains excessively with wind, the elevator goes down. We've already put in roughly $100,000 to repair this elevator. So we know that we have a large redesign that's coming and we are working with parks as well as the property owner to try and do something that will last the test of time. So as soon as we reopen, we'll come back to that project. And technically that elevator is owned by the, the related companies. That was going to be my question. Who, I thought that was built as a part of the Caledonia development. So they're, they're, they're the ones who'd be responsible for that fix at the end of the day? Not exactly. It still needs to be approved by parks. Okay, but they would pay for it, right, Gail? Uh, actually, <laughs> no. My understanding is actually that this will be a capital project uh, shared by both Friends of the High Line, really Friends of the High Line. We're responsible for the overall maintenance of the elevator beyond regular ice maintenance. Yeah, so originally the city is, tech I mean, was supposed to be responsible for all of the elevators, but they were being repaired so um, pretty slowly. So we took that on and has taken those costs to try to repair them quicker. I know it's not often not fast enough. I mean, that's something, but we've tried to speed up uh, the repair times. Um, our elevators are getting not are probably not getting better. I mean, you know, all of our elevators, no matter how you say they're meant to be outside, they're really all outside. And so we, you know, it's, it's one of the big, bigger, our biggest struggles in terms of maintenance, I would say is elevators. I wanna to go to Sally, please. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, first of all, I miss the High Line like I can't tell you. So um, I have been thinking about when and if you can open and just wanna throw a few ideas out that I've been thinking about particularly with the, uh, the manning of an opening, um, because it will be a little complicated. I imagine there are a lot of volunteers, you already have volunteers, um, but if it meant manning an exit, you know, um, coming down from the High Line, I believe there's probably a lot more people in the community that would be willing to participate in something like that. But you might also be faced with um, making the, the open hours shorter um, so that you can man it you know, well enough, you'd have, you'd have to have shorter hours, um, I think. Then I, there's a complication I don't know if you've thought about. I wonder if you do limit the number of people, which obviously you would have to do, which might not be as difficult considering that we won't have tourists here um, or very few, um, is when people sit down to stay. Um, I mean, it's not always a fluid 
movement of traffic going through the High Line. There are people that just park themselves there for the whole day. So I, oh, half a day, or how, how, how do you count those people? And the only other thing that has crossed my mind was um, uh, two-way traffic, you know, north-south traffic, where people are in, I assume the people would be required to wear masks, um, but that the traffic would flow uh, in one direction, north to south, and then, it, and then you know, uh, south to north, uh, going only one way. And um, those are my thoughts. I hope you figure it out because we need you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Sal. And we're thinking of all the, those are really helpful. So thank you. That's. Marty, you're on mute. My bad, Jeffrey, did you need to speak again? Yeah, just and then to, Blake. Uh, sorry, everybody, on the elevator question, um, is that a contractual agreement with the city of New York and Highline's responsibility with the elevators? Because I would be, think that if it isn't, the committee might entertain the idea of encouraging payment be supported by that building. Um, it, it is actually a contractual agreement, um, but I think we are all invested so heavily. The cost is, this is a very rare case, you will never hear me say these words again, that the cost is less of an issue than it is to make sure that what the fix is, is going to actually be the right one. Exactly. Yeah, we'll pay more in repairing it. Right. But we should, Gail, I want us to look again at the zoning. Um, I know that, I think, um, Jeffrey, they had to build it. Yeah. They have to build it. I don't. I don't know if it's that they are responsible for. Right. Uh, they are responsible for some of the maintenance on it, but right. not bigger stuff. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for that presentation. I had a couple statements and then a question. Uh, the first one is, you know, I would agree with Sally that I'm not sure if there's a ton lost by just having the traffic be a one way. You know, which I think reduces some of the risk of um, you know people getting more face to face on those on those walkways. Yep. And then the second point was, you know, I think it'll be important to have consistency of training for the attendants for the entrances and exits. Yeah. You know, I know people have varying opinions about the importance of masks and you know varying degrees of um, taking the situation seriously. Uh, you know, so I think having a consistent response that um, you know will create as little disturbance as possible and you know arm those volunteers or whomever at those entrances to react appropriately yeah the question is um you know i wonder if you could explain a little more about the indicators that you're looking at in order to inform when would be a safe time you know particularly given that uh, you know we're kind of getting from phase one to phase two what are you looking at to determine when it's safe yeah i'm this is really where it's up to the city um, I think, I, and I, I, I don't think, I don't know what to say how the date, I mean, we're, I don't, I don't think it's going to be this month. I hope it's next month. I don't know if that's helpful at all. I can't guarantee you. I'm now I'm seeing, I'm in, I'm on YouTube live. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know if that's helpful of where, you know, where we're falling. Um, one of the hard parts is it's not really, um, a lot of it, you know, normally you think, okay, we just have a occupancy number that's important. The problem we've had in the past, because we've had uh, safety issues with crowds before, and it's not that we're hitting our fire code capacity, Gail, correct me if I'm wrong, is like 6,000 or something at any one time. It's not that we're hitting over that, it's that at any one spot, you have too many people. So, I mean, that's why I think your feedback is is helpful for us to hear about the one way, because that's where we get into problems where you have significant parts where it's eight feet. Um, and so it's very hard to have social distancing. So the problem is not, you know, you could have 50 people, but if all 50 people are trying to go back and forth on that path is where you have problems. And again, that's where a lot of it, I think all of our best laid plans are then going to be, uh, it's going to be different by how people use it. Um, you know, and, and I think we won't know. I think the one thing I've always found in the High Line, and people always said their crowds are going to, you know, trample the plants and, you know, pick all the flowers. And, you know, we have found people, some people 
very few people trample the plants and people have been really respectful of it. And um, I, I think that that's the good news. And I think people, it's also a different kind of environment because you're, you, we can, in terms of mass, we can communicate going up the stairs in a way it's much harder to do in other parks. Parks department has offered to give us masks also um, for people that you know don't have masks, we can offer them masks. Um, and we have a lot of, I think, good learning of what's worked and hasn't worked in other parks, you know, and how to do that respectfully. Thank you. Like, uh, like, I'm going to go to uh, uh, David, and then I'll speak, and then I'll call on Lowell. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Robert. Um, you know, I, I have a hard time imagining how you could avoid congestion points if it's not one-way traffic. Um, and you know it, you can sort of control things if you go into like Italy now you go in at one point and out at another and and because there's a single point of entrance they can limit uh, people coming in I guess you could it could be one way and it could still be somewhat spontaneous because people could enter at any of the stairs as long as they're willing to turn either left or right and maybe you could have alternate days where it's it flows north and south and uh, you know, regular users like Sally could keep track of that. I think it might be very important to have signage, maybe at the street corners, uh, if you're going to do something like that. And one thing I have noticed recently is uh, the public space at Hudson Yards, like around the vessel, since the protests, it's been largely closed off with hurricane fencing. Uh, it's, it's kind of off-putting because that's meant to be public space and yet, you know, it's now in this very defensive posture. So I don't know if you have any coordination with them, but that Hudson Yard space is a major point of outflow from the High Line in normal times. Yeah, we, we, we've, um, we actually asked them just for their advice on how they do and what are they projecting. Um, but I didn't know I, that this was before the protests. So yeah, that's a, like like along 11th Avenue, it's yeah. it's usually completely closed off. I haven't seen it. And oh. at other other points, it's very restricted with guards. Yeah. That it, David. That's it. Thank you, sir. Uh, I I wanted to uh, echo the the one way uh, ideas that have been expressed before, and I, and I would I would like to know if you. In thinking about one way, what, what came to my mind was having a, an entrance somewhere in the middle of the highway, north, uh, High Line North South, have people make a choice when they get up to the High Line to go north or south and have it one way direction exiting at the north or south. Mm -hmm. But you're going to have to do some flow designing in order to figure that out. So, my first question is Have you done any thinking about? Um, pedestrian flow on the High Line as a result of your attempt to open it. Have you, have you begun to think about how you're going to communicate this to the larger community, not just as you're coming into the, um, into the High Line? Have you, have you thought any about, um, I think that communication has to contain some sense of safety in public yeah. assembly, uh, some sense of what what the hazards of Corona are and how to be safe on a narrow space like the High Line itself. And finally, um, you mentioned uh, funding uh, because you're going to have to staff, uh, I use the word staff, not man, I like it better, uh, staff the um, entrance by counting, staff the exits by counting so that the entrance will know how many more people to permit up because you know and I know that not everybody's going to go up to the high line and just walk straight to the exit. They're going yeah. to loiter, they're going to sit down, hopefully they're not going to sneeze in anybody else's face, but unfortunately we're all people and in a crowded space that happens too and you're going to have to, you're going to, have to in some way make sure that everybody's wearing a, it's not wearing a mask. Um, I, I think opening the highlight, you, you're right to raise the issue. It's an extremely complex, uh, a meeting like this will give you some ideas, but uh, you're going to have to design a program and maybe bring it back to this committee and have us look at the program that you've designed so we can tear that apart for you, which you probably want us to do. 
Yeah, no, I, this is exactly, and, and, but it, and it's, very, it's really helpful to hear a lot of these things because a lot of things we're considering, you know, it's, it's just helpful to hear that. And definitely, I think one-way traffic is probably the biggest issue. Um, I mean, the good news is the Highline is designed as, uh, you know, it, it's a walkway. It's not just open completely. So um, once people started going one direction, I think they would get it, you know, whereas if you're in just a normal big square, it doesn't work like that. Um, I think communications is going to be a huge part of this. And I mean, you know, and we know no one wants to come if they don't feel safe. Um, so I think communicating what we're doing, what we, what we can do to keep people safe and then what people are going to need to do to keep themselves and others, others safe. I, um, but I, I do feel that the other, the good news, what we found with signage on the High Line, I don't know if you remember when we had the monks that were asking for $20. Um, they we put one sign up on the high line or two, two maybe two signs about that and they went away because people start stopped giving uh immediately so people because this because of that the the it's your it's a sort of a shoot people can look at signs and so i mean one of the things we've been thinking of doing is you know remember the old burma shave commercials i don't know if you remember where you instead of having like 20 things on one sign you put each each sign has one message, but so people um, get that. I think a lot of it's going to have to be communicated before they go up on the high line. Um, you know, either down, either before they come or or down at the base. So it's something we're 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 actually. Uh, I, I don't know if you, Paula Share is the woman that designed our high line logo 21 years ago, and so we went back to her and are asking her to help us. How can we communicate, you know, these things uh, in a in a simple way once once we know what they are? Um, okay. you know, okay. Someone asked about seating. That's another question that we're looking at. Um, you know, does it make sense? Some parks have sort of taped off their seating. Some have limited it to one person. Um, well, now you're starting to talk about an issue that I that obviously you need to talk think more about because if I go up to the High Line at any entrance that you design for me. Uh, I will not walk straight to whatever exit you design for me. So part of your thinking has to be, where are you going to permit me to loiter safely? Yeah. Where can I lurk in a safe way? I mean, I, I, I spend a lot of time looking over the rail at the High Line at whatever is going on off the High Line, as well as the, I mean, I look at the vegetation. We look outside the High Line and if I have I can't keep my, whatever the number is, six feet, eight feet, I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna be among those folks that don't wanna come. Yeah, and on the seating, I think, um, you know, that's one of the things a lot of public spaces have done is, uh, is it, with that same issue, you know, it's not just the High Line, people wanna sit down. I'm um, not just because they want to, because or they, they need to. And so one of the things is limiting this, you know, and, and some of this they've said has been very um, successful in just telling people, you know, it's really just if you need to sit down, otherwise it's not about lingering. We, we have something called the Highline Network. It's a network of other infrastructure reuse projects across the country. And most of them have opened and it's been really helpful talking to them. We just had a conversation with them about just how are we all responding to the Black Lives movement and um, you know, some of them are places of protest, some of them are not, um, but all of them are, are grappling with how do, you, how do you best, as a public space, um, how do you do that, and both internally and, and externally. Um, but yes, that's, I will definitely take that into account. Thank you. CB4 Chair Lowell Kern. Hi, I'm sorry I was late. The New York Blood Center held me up. Um, good to see you all. Um, I did not see the presentation tonight. I saw a version of it earlier. I'm listening to the discussion about one-way traffic, and I'm thinking to myself, well, okay, if everything is flowing south and you let people on 
at Hudson Yards, you can't let people on anywhere else. Because if I'm coming down from Hudson Yards, I may want to get off at 23rd Street. And there may be somebody else who wants to get on at 23rd Street and head south. But then we're going to be crossing, instead of crossing on the High Line, we're going to be crossing on the stairs. Yeah. So these are the things we're thinking about. <laughs> yeah. So you've got, you know, it's basically you can get on at one point and you can get off anywhere along the way. And for most, I mean, you have two different types of visitors. You have New Yorkers who use it as, you know, a better than the sidewalk and you've got the tourists who come. I think with that kind of flow, you're going to lose more of the New Yorkers except for Sally and Marty. Um, you know, I, if I get on, at, I mean, if I'm at Hudson Yards and I want to go home, I can get off at 23rd Street, but yeah. I can't get on at 23rd Street and go down to the Whitney because I'll be crossing everyone on the stairs. Yeah. So the thought that came to me at that point is if you just keep traffic moving, you, I don't know if you have to go one direction because as long as everyone's moving, you're not going to be in close contact with any one individual for more than a couple of seconds. So maybe you don't have to go one way because if I pass someone, you know, there's, there's probably little <clears throat> risk there because they, everything I've heard is that it's, you know, sustained exposure. It's no different than passing someone on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So if you keep it so you can keep the numbers down so traffic keeps moving, um, you probably don't have to go one way. The problem you run into, what Marty was just talking about, is the overlook spots, 23rd Street, where people gather at the rail to look down 23rd Street. If you take that part away, you lose some of the essence of the High Line, which is putting you back in the city, and your overlook on 10th Avenue at 16th Street, you know, what do you do? Do you only let two people sit down at a time on the overlook? Um, I'm not sure how to work that, but I don't know that one way is the answer here because it's going to create different usage problems about where people can get on and off um, or you're going to be passing on the stairs. And if you're going to pass on the stairs, you might as well pass on the high line. Yeah. My and two cents. I, you know, this is going to be the difficulty for us is we're going to have to make compromises at some point on it. It's just not going to be... Um, and, and I think we're going to have to experiment as well. I think that's the really important part is I think we're going to be able to figure out what, what do we think and, and the parks department, again, sort of ultimately it is not our decision. Obviously they care about our opinion deeply, but ultimately it's sort of a city decision. Um, but, and, but I think they're open and they've seen this in other places. You can think how it's going to use you know, it's going to be used and then it's not going to be used that way. And so really being open to being really flexible. And I think the great thing about it, of talking to them is, you know, they'll say they're considering things they would never consider before <laughs> um, because they know they have to. So they've been, you know, more flexible, more open to different ideas. And I think also, I mean, we're going to want to hear from y'all when we open what's working and what's not working. And we don't know how long this is going to have to go on. I mean, that's the other big difficulty. Um, and what we don't want to do is have to close it again. You know, by doing something that we do, it's not safe and people feel we have to close it. That's, um, but I think keep having either, you know, us keep coming back to this meeting or figure out, you know, a working group that could help us advise. Cause I think it's going to happen we're going to need to re respond sort of, you know, I think that first week will be the most critical week because then you're, you're going to learn a lot and then figure out how do we respond the second week. All that, you know, as Marty was saying, it's then also tricky if you change things because you have to communicate them. And so how do you not confuse people? You tell them one thing and then we've changed it. So, um, yeah, you may be better off putting a small group together, talk to Marty and Jeffrey about that, because you're going to want to coordinate with Rich Cacopolo's team down at CB2 as well. Yeah. And instead of having to go to both community boards, maybe put everyone in one room. I see a, one more committee member who wants to speak, and I don't know how many members of the public also want to make comments. Um, but let me go to Sally. 
I just want to follow up some of the comments and well, of course, you're 100% right. If we walk by each other quickly, uh, there's really very little, if, if, if zero risk. And if, with the crowd control, um, that probably is not a risk. Um, but I, obviously, we have to think about all possibilities of, of one direction or, or, or better monitoring. And, and I think um, if you can secure a number of volunteers to help at the stairs and on the high line, that's gonna help a lot. And I think those people will be available. I think the communication, um, I mean, there are so many avenues for communication and, and besides your newsletter and everything else, I mean, just the information at the stairways. I mean, you have stuff, you know, no dogs down there, it's all posted. People will get it pretty quickly because basically you really are gonna be dealing with New Yorkers. It's not gonna be every week there's gonna be 5,000 new people coming um, because the tourists are not here. So I don't think yeah. communication is gonna be as great a problem as it's being perceived as. Um, as far as seating is concerned, when I brought that up initially, in terms of, uh, of controlling the numbers of crowds, I was more concerned about people that come and want to sit for several hours. I don't know how you count them as part of the crowd. I wasn't thinking of it in terms of people being near each other because I don't know the rest of, I've been, I've been to Madison Square Park, I've been to Central Park, I've been I've, I've been parking it because, you know, we're all trapped in here. I go to Hudson River Park. People are very respectful of the bench space. If I sit down on a bench, no one sits near me there on the next bench. I have never been in a situation in all the parks where somebody has crowded me on a bench. You may have situations where you have the lounge chairs that they're really close to each other, but it's easy to move some of them off so that they're, they're better space. So I, I don't see the seating issue just based on personal observation of being in parks and sitting on benches. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that the good news is, is this is outdoors where we know there's less possibility for transmission. And if the New York City subway can open, I think that the hotline can definitely <laughs> be out. <laughs> right. So let's just go for it and come up with the way. Great. Any other board uh, uh, panel members want to make a comment? Uh, I mean, do we do we have any folks that are off the panel that want to make a comment? There are there are so you all know. I mean, you probably do because you see it on your screen. There are nineteen panelists and there are thirteen attendants. At, uh, yeah, Betty wants to speak. I'm gonna allow her to speak. Okay. Yeah. Wait, I'm sorry. I'm one sec so the alarm will go off if I leave. Uh, so what would happen is I think Betty, Maritza, can you hear us? Maritza, while Robert's doing that, um, one of the things I've noticed that I wanted to raise with you guys, mm -hmm. there is a lot of garbage collecting on the stairs at twenty third street. People are dumping stuff there and because no one's using it, it's not getting cleaned off. Okay, okay great. If you guys could look into that. Noted, we will. Thank you. Well, Sorry, I shouldn't be here. And now we have Betty McIntosh, do we? And there's some comments also, Robert, if you want to take a look at the conversation. Betty had her hand up. I'm not sure if she wants to speak. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. okay. Um, just a, I, I love the high line. I want it to open as soon as it can. Can you hear me still? Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, there's a few thoughts about it. I mean, I think people raised all most of the relevant topics. Um, one is like a, a certain times when you could come to the high line or, you know, like early in, early in the morning or something. I, I don't know, maybe there's some way of timing it. Um, and then maybe there's some way of specific groups of people like I, I don't even know if that even makes sense but you know the people from Chelsea Elliott or the people from Penn South or or something you know maybe because maybe there's friends that want to go together or something like that and that might be enjoyable for people who've been <laughs> stuck in their apartments for so long um, 
And then another thought I had is, I noticed that some of my friends have, have gone on planes and trains and gone to other cities. So I think that saying, oh, this is all for New Yorkers and locals, I think it's gradually, you're gonna have tourists come and maybe quicker than you think they're gonna come because there's such a pent up demand. Maybe they're not coming from Europe, but maybe they're coming from Chicago or something, you know. I think, it, so I think that's another factor to, to throw in the pot, you know. Um, and I just think, I, I, I think it may be, Maybe you can start with a pilot or something and then see what, what happens in a pilot and let everybody know that, that this is something you're trying and it may or may not work. You know? mm -hmm. So anyway, that, that's, that's, I, I like the pilot. That's it's always good to call something a pilot and then <laughs> see how it goes. <laughs> anyway, thank you for being so thoughtful. That's oh, it. Thanks, Betty. Um, and then the question uh, in the chat, um, from Kit, is it possible to offer weekly GoPro tours from one of the docents? Um, that could be really fun. I love, I love that idea. So, all right. Um, where are we in summar summarizing this? And um, I guess I'm not. I appreciate the presentation. I, I think it's very important for us to learn about what the Highline is hoping to do. That is open. What do you need from us and where do we go from here? Um, I think I'm going to put my, um, my email. Um, most of you all know where, how to get Maritza, but if you, you know, if you have anything from me, I'm, and it's pretty easy, it's Robert at the highline.org. Um, and I think just coming back as, as our conversations develop, um, you know, with the parks department and thank y'all, y'all been very responsive when we first even started thinking about this, you know, y'all were willing to, to talk to us then. And so I think it's just continuing this dialogue. And once we come up with something more concrete to talk it through and then help keeping us just keep tweaking it. Because, you know, I, as Betty said it, no matter what we call it, this is a pilot because we don't know how it's going to work. Um, so Anybody, any, any other comments that anybody would want to make? I see two. I see Dave and I see Brad. So Dave first. Um, while we've still got you, I'm just curious whether there's any progress on 18th Street Plaza or when you might be uh, releasing a design for it. Yeah, um, I, you know, we're waiting on HFC. HFC is building it. Um, we, it becomes a public park, but it's technically sort of theirs. Um, the trigger, just so you know, sort of the legal is certain kind of occupancy in the top floors. Um, they have to have it open to be able to have that occupancy. Um, they've continued to have a lot of turmoil. So we haven't, I, I don't have a good answer you know, for that. I know work has been continuing on some of the buildings, period, their, their buildings start and stop. Um, and I think we have a, um, the design that we released, I mean, I think it was just a while ago, but that still holds. Um, they're, they're technically building it. And so we're also gonna just have to watch that very closely because they're, they're building it. Um, does when technically they're building it mean they're actually building it or they're responsible to be building it? Um, they are technically building it. I mean, they're, I mean, I, they're, their contractors are going to build it, not ours. So we have the right to inspect and we, but they're not, it's not um, that they will be paying their contractors. So we don't have as much control is normally other parts of the High Line, for example, are being built by EDC. And so we're, um, we're with them at sort of every step. So uh, it, it's, 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 it's less ideal, <laughs> um, but that's how it was written in the deal with the city was done, so. Thank you. Uh, next person is Brad and then Jeffrey. Hi, Robert. 
thanks for the presentation, but I'm just wondering what has the parks department, what is their input currently? I mean, subways are open, people are walking on sidewalks. I can't possibly understand why a park that is needed now is being closed. I'm just trying to yeah. I mean, you know, they're in the process of opening a lot of their inventory of things, you know, and, and part of it is staffing. Like if they told me to open tomorrow, I don't have the staff to open it. So one of the things we're doing right now is trying to hire up. It's the same thing, you know, why the beaches um, aren't open. I think they're hiring, you know, lifeguards, but I'm, I'm with you. I, I, you know, I have to say, given all that they're dealing with and that they've kept all their other parks open, I'm sim sympathetic to their um, playing, but but I hear you, I wanna get it open. Uh, it's, I have to tell you, I, uh, Maurizio who's on the phone, he can always tell if I'm in the, at the high line because my, he said my voice sounds happier. <laughs> um, and you know, we see it and I think they see it as part of, um, you know, what we can do for New York, that it's part of reopening New York. But they haven't given you any guidelines. They haven't said it's really a month is really what you're feeling or just trying to get a sense of, because we're being pretty vague here. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think a lot of their, it's, a, there are just so many factors. There's not one piece. Yeah. Brad? Anything else, Brad? Do I go to the next speaker? Oh, thank you, Robert. No, I'm okay. Thanks, Brad. Uh, Jeffrey. Just quickly point, I guess, Robert, Highline, is there anything we can do to help you in this situation? Is a letter to the Parks Department um, encouring them to no, highlight your solutions or anything that we can do to help you? I, I think um, it will just, it, it could just. It, I don't, I don't thank you and let us keep thinking. I mean, you and I talked about, you know, do we need to figure out would street closures help? Like, I'd love to come back on that. Um, I'd love to just keep, you know, being able to come back to the leadership of this group, like we've been doing to have quick conversations as things develop. So I, I think y'all are doing great. Uh, you know, something and Jeffrey, this where, you know, both of your hats when something we're talking about is how do we support local businesses once we're open? Because again, we when people come to the High Line, um, there you know we can tell them things that are open and where to go afterwards. So that's something I, I get, to me that's a little set. We want to get open, but that's something I'd like to start you know thinking about. Um, and then I think you know using this, uh, I think we're going to get a lot of feedback from people when we open, positive or negative, and how do we do it better? And how do we keep those channels open? I think. Um, it's something I know Maurizio wanted does. I feel like the Highland's been open 10 years. It's working. I feel like a lot of our community engagement, some of our muscles, um, you know, we're, we're talking to some of y'all, but I think we just like to do more of that. So, you know, using this sort of as, a, as another reason to have more dialogue about the things that we're doing. So I know that's something Maritza and, you know, um, Maurizio, and you'll you'll hear more about from us. So, but thank you for asking. I think Jeffrey would agree with what I'm going to say as as a co-chair. Uh, we love to have you come back and report on the goings on of the High Line. Uh, my my own recollection is that we haven't heard from you recently, although I know that there are lots of folks that are sitting on committees that have to do with the High Line, but the committee as a whole hasn't heard. And so. We welcome you back in a shorter period of time than you than since the last. Right, time. and you know when this is all over, I'm happy to have a standing. You know, whenever you want to hear from us, <laughs> it's easy, um, and so maybe that's something we'll. I mean, I think we're going to have a lot of dialogue about this, but maybe when this is over, uh, you know, it's it's just like all these things that some of the good ha habits that we're starting. Can we, you know, um, can we try to keep them? Um, from, from my position, I, 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 I don't know that the whole committee agrees, but I bet they do. Yes, please, uh, let's do it. Uh, and uh, yes, things, the, the new normal isn't going to be the normal that we, yeah, before all of this, yeah, uh, in at least two realms of pandemics, not 
just not just for Corona. Anybody else? Well, thank you. Uh, any any Highline staff want to put in something other than uh, Robert's done all the talking? We haven't heard your voices. I very quickly wanted to respond. You you asked you asked some very thoughtful questions about the way in which we're looking at the ways that people will walk on the High Line and flow through the High Line, and we actually are doing a fair amount of calculations, which we really hope to share with you at the next meeting, that involve with the first staircases whether or not people can enter in the middle. What the flows would be, um, what the, what's the net square footage that's available based on all of these spaces. So we look forward to sharing that with you when we come back to you. That's really good to hear. Thank you. Yeah, I'll reiterate that. That of course I'm so grateful for all the support that CB4 and this committee specifically has given us over the years, and I think we'll be uh, in a better position in July to share more information about our plans and to come back with uh, with more. Uh, for input. So uh, look forward to seeing you all again soon in July. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll just wrap up by saying that once we do have the reopening plans, we do plan, even before we do that, we do plan to actually have to go to a lot of these places that some folks mentioned, whether it's Chelsea Elliott, whether it's Ben South, Fulton, others, to personally invite them back and not here via a social media tweet or our website. We don't, we want folks to hear from us um, as much as possible because we want to be able to kind of continue the relationship we have with them and as well as kind of grow it. And so that's something we're committed to and, and you all are included in that kind of, that commitment. You probably know that Penn South has a periodic internal announcement, electronic announcement, which would be great to see you on. Anybody else? Um, I don't think that there are other agenda items. Thank you. Uh, but there is the uh, old business, new business sequence that I have to go through, isn't there, Jeffrey? Already, yes. And can, if I could also, first of all, thank you, friends of the Highland. But can we acknowledge our new committee members who've joined us for the first time? Because we had a couple of new appointments tonight, or that they've, they've joined us this evening. Um, Sarah, we'll start with you alphabetical, I guess. Jeffrey, yeah, okay. I so. I know if I'm supposed to leave the building. They're, they're uh, the Highland, I think, Marty, is it okay if they leave, right? Well, I, everybody except for Robert have them locked in the building and then we'll take <laughs> care of the Highline. Everybody else can leave. Thank you, Highline folks, okay. Robert. Thank and you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mark, Thank I, you. We really appreciate your presentation. Get home safe. Okay. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Sorry, I just wanted to, I know we have two new members and I wanted to, I'm glad we dove right in, but just let the committee know since we're not in person. Um, Sarah and Colin are joining us um, as members of the committee. So hi, Sarah and Colin. Sarah, you're a new board member. So say hello if you don't mind. Yes, hi, I'm a new board member based out of Chelsea on 16th Street. Um, so close to that broken elevator. Um, lovely to meet you all of you all virtually again, um, and hopefully at some point we'll actually be able to meet all of you in person. I, and I, so, I, so this is one of my committees, transportation is my other committee. I want to echo, echo the in-person piece. When we have a non-virtual meeting, I, nobody knows when that's going to be. I don't, I, I don't see that before sometime. Well, Vaccine, vaccine, vaccine. Uh, but when we have it, uh, we need to spend a few moments shaking each other's hands and getting to know each other. Uh, we, have, we, we just come in and go to business so quickly that we don't spend any personal time. Anyway, uh, who's the next person going to introduce? And then, uh, Mr. Wright, who has been a board member for a while, but he is adding a new weight to the committee. And uh, the northern part of the district has some new weight as he's a Hell's Kitchen resident now. So Colin. <laughs> well, what, what are you saying he lifts weights? What, what are you I, saying? Well, <laughs> I do, but uh, I am Colin Wright. I've been on the board for about a year now. Um, I was living in Chelsea on West 22nd and 9th Avenue before. Um, and earlier this year, I moved to Gotham West in Hell's Kitchen. And so alongside that change, um, 
Lowell and I decided to, for me to join the Parks Committee because it adds a little bit of neighborhood geographical diversity to the, to the Parks Committee, apparently. Um, so I'm happy to be here. I, this, was, this actually was my first choice. I was coming from the Chelsea Land Use Committee, um, but I was, I was really hoping to be on the Parks Committee. So I'm glad I'm here and I'm also on transportation as well. In my career, I'm a transportation advocate, so I was actually very curious about the elevator conversation. I'm deeply involved with accessibility on the New York City subway system, and I can um, vouch for the fact that the city and buildings and parks and the MTA are absolutely horrendous when it comes to maintenance of elevators, and these contracts are extraordinarily important in terms of delineating who pays for what. And so I can definitely uh, sympathize, but also uh, criticize a little bit the Highline for their, for their handling of those contracts. <laughs> but I didn't do that while they were here. <laughs> anyway, thanks. Thank you. Uh, any new business or old business, new or old business? Go ahead, uh, uh, Brett. Uh, yeah, so I had a couple of items that I wanted to bring up with the committee. Um, and Ginny, and I sent you a, a PDF file. I don't know if you got it. Otherwise, I can share my screen if that's possible. Um, yeah, I just got it. Let me open it. Give me one moment. Sure. Um, I'll try to make them as brief as we can make them. All right, perfect. Um, so the first item I want to talk about is Chelsea Park. So uh, we go to the next slide. So Chelsea Park, as you all know, West Side. Uh, next slide. It's uh, 28th Street, 10th Avenue, between 9th and 10th. Um, a lot of housing around it. It's um, a big park. Uh, if you go to the next slide. So it's, it's, uh, it's Chelsea's largest city park. Um, by far, and uh, it's it's got a lot of active space. It's 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 a very diverse place. Um, people of all walks of life use this at all hours, morning, afternoon, evening. And as we all know, it's been it's been very busy this year with all the gyms closed. This has been a very active park. Um, but I really want to just focus on the track overall. The park is in is in pretty good shape. Um, but if we if we go to the next slide. Um, so the, the track in particular has been an issue brought, it's been discussed in this committee before, but I think it's now something we've really got to urge. Uh, next slide. Um, so we can start talking about the track and as this shows you, the track isn't really anchored to anything. It just kind of, it's been kind of sliding around, um, just friction holding it down and it's been coming apart. The surface itself is pretty slick. Anyone who's run on it, uh, if it's been raining, uh, you really don't want to get over, you know, eight and a half miles an hour because it's it's a little dangerous. Um, but it the, the um, level of of dilapidation has been accelerating um, even more than the last few years. Uh, the next slide. Um, you can see that they've been trying to patch the the gaps, and then the the, the patches are too small, and they've been putting these cones down to warn people where the dangerous parts are. Uh, the, co the cones have been growing like mushrooms this year. Uh, next slide. Um, and, and this year, it's, it's gotten to the point where it's actually um, making these tripping hazards. So uh, the next slide, um, I think this is something I hope our committee can, can quickly urge the city to just, let's just fix this. Let's just replace this track. It's been overdue. And I think it's probably now even a liability. And uh, given how intense the the park has been used this year, um, including this track, um, where you know people doing their gym workouts with their gym buddies, and now we're doing sprinting and kind of running together, in addition to the usual crowds, um, I think we just need to we need to write something formal to the parks department to get them to fix this. What is it that you're suggesting we bring, Brett? Um, I'm, I'm asking we write a letter to the Parks Department that they should please fix, the, the replace the track, which has been overdue for a replacement for some time now. I'll Especially second that. Seconding it. I 
Uh, Want to hear if there's anybody that objects? Uh, hearing nobody or seeing nobody, uh, I um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go to uh, Alan, but I'm going to make the suggestion before I go to Alan that since you've done the work you've done, Brett, you write the first draft. Sure. Alan. A question. Uh, didn't we have um, a presentation from Parks about Chelsea Park, um, I don't know, late last year? With, and was there something about... It was only about the workout area, Alan. It wasn't about the track, if my memory serves me correctly. Yeah, I, I wasn't quite sure, but I thought, I thought the track was brought up at that time also. They said they would look at it or something. Was there anything? To, but all right, I know. At one point, I know uh, Corey Johnson had had allocated money to it, which I think he's reallocated to something else. Um, you're right; it's it's we, we every time the Chelsea Park comes up, in this I, I know I brought this up a few times. Uh, the thing that we got the presentation on last year was the active workout area um, by the basketball court, and also that's the basketball court that got painted with all those uh, bright colors. So. Okay. Um, if, if I can just hold on to the microphone for a minute and put my plug in on the heliport, on 30th Street heliport. Well, let's finish. I, I'll come right back to you after the, after the track is finished. Oh, okay. Okay. And I did have one it, other. It may indeed be finished. <laughs> and, and, and Brett had another item. Uh, so, I'm, I, Alan, I'm going to ask you to cue. Um, the track is finished. Red is writing the, uh, the first uh, draft of the letter that's got all the information and pictures. And the letter is going to uh, Parks Department with copies to all the electeds. And everybody agrees with that. I hear no objections. Next item. Red. OK. Um, so back to the presentation. So this is something that is not, I'm, I'm just putting this on the table. I'm hoping it can, we can get this on the agenda. Uh, for the next meeting, something upcoming. Um, again, given how much people are using our, our open spaces, this is something that's become more of a issue, but this is a long-term issue. Um, just wanna put it out there. So Jeannie, if you can uh, put it up here. So just a little bit of context. Um, part of what I do uh, when I'm not wearing my community board hat is I'm planning justice facilities. So um, comparable to when I'm, working with clients trying to uh, help plan a courthouse. So it's a civic building, public money goes into these things and these buildings should not be sitting vacant, especially when uh, space is, is much needed. So I'll look at a space like say the jury assembly room and say, gosh, this is a really big room, biggest in the courthouse and you're using it maybe 20% of the time because there are only so many jury, jury uh, trials. So we'll find other reasons and uh, other other uses that are needed and we'll repurpose a jury assembly room so it can be used for multiple causes. So what does this have to do with public space? So I wanna um, call a couple of areas in the Hudson River Park. Um, so, so, so you all have a chance to check it out, do your research and um, have an informed conversation on this upcoming since these are uh, bigger, tight, bigger, bigger um, plans um, and hopefully people can look at these and not come up with all the reasons why we can't do something, but let's, let's work something through with these. Um, so the two areas, if we go to the next slide, the first one I wanna uh, uh, point out is we've got the, the Chelsea Pierce frontage. I'm sure you all know where this is. Um, uh, if you go to the next slide, so, um, so we all know that this is the area where the, 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 the bike path narrows uh, to its most uh, narrow point, I think in our entire district. Um, sidewalks pretty narrow there too. So we've got a lot, a lot of people walking, running, sharing limited pedestrian space um, all along the front of Chelsea Piers. Uh, um, if you look at the next slide. Um, meantime, we've got this cobblestone street, which I would, you know, I'm gonna make up a number 87% uh, of the time is mostly not active. It's, it's almost wide enough to accommodate a three lane street. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that makes me think, oh gosh, how do we have a, a public space like this that's dedicated to cars that are only really jamming this up before say a banquet, an event that's being hosted uh, every now and then, like on Monday night, there were some uh, moving vans that were parked along the left side, like maybe five of them in the, in the left lane, just standing there. 
Um, but otherwise, this is mostly vacant like this. So this is an area I would want to put on the table and challenge um, the Hudson River Park and everyone to let's let's figure out how do we convert this so scheduled you know that, that beer garden that we uh, we push back on and and uh, foil the plans for right on up here at 64 maybe that comes out here maybe we need to put some lemonade stands um open seating or just make it a wider uh pedestrian area uh obviously we we have to make sure chelsea piers continues to operate um so when they need it they know that there's an event they it can be closed but this is something that I would want to put on the table is let's really look at this because this is a long stretch of park in an area that we know gets crowded. Um, so that's, that's my uh, thought on this area. Um, so hopefully y'all can go take a, take, a, take a look at it with an eye towards what can we do. Um, the other area I want to identify well, is something- Before you switch areas, uh, sure. would you make a suggestion as to who should come and speak with us about the usage of this Area? I think we should, I think know. I think we should start a conversation with the Hudson River Park Trust. Um, you know, I have had some conversations with Noreen about this, so you know she's aware that I'm bringing these up, and um, you know I think she she would welcome the opportunity to to start imagining this. I think we all recognize that this isn't something that's going to happen in a year. Um, you know, obviously there are going to be you know the, the you know the tenant is going to have the say in this as well. Um, so we'd have to come up with ways to make it work for them as well. Maybe there's a way that they can increase the revenue stream if they can, you know, activate and, and, and acquire some of the revenue from, from uses out here, for example. So um, I think, you know, we would want to talk to the Hudson River Park Trust um, and see if they would like to invite any of their tenants along. Thank you. Next point. Okay. Um, other area which comes with other complications in the next, sli next slide. Um, the, the cruise ship's waterfront. Uh, this is also an area that, uh, if we look at the next slide, um, again, there's a shared, you know, very narrow pedestrian area, people bleeding into the bikeway constantly um, in, this, in, in this fairly long stretch uh, bounded by the, the, the highway and the, the cruise ship uh, terminal area. Um, if you look at the next slide, um, you know, it's a double decker operation they have here. You know, they're separating out cars, taxis, buses. So it's it's a it's a transportation issue. And again, we have to make sure that whatever we would suggest, the the cruise ship terminals have to be able to operate in a way that is safe and um, and accommodates their needs. So we're not looking to undo what they do. It's just to activate a space. As anyone who uh, knows this area, it's it's active. Sometimes, but you know, 87% of the time, it is not very active at all. Um, and so it's something that we can t look to time. So if we look at the next slide. Um, so it's that area, there's just, those parking spaces are rarely used, rarely occupied. Um, it's an open area. My understanding is there actually is a, there was actually a pedestrian area that was built and then it was closed after 9-11 for security reasons. So those are all things, so there's reasons why it's not accessible, um, but I would want to wonder, is there a way we can um, address the issues and open it back up so that the waterfront can uh, once again be um, open to the public? Uh, if you look at the next slide, we might need some outside help to uh, help burst our way through there. Um, get people back out by the water uh, in a way that can be scheduled with the cruises. And so again, this is, you know, Hudson River Park Trust would um, we'd want to invite them and see if they want to bring their tenant to see if we can start coming up with some ideas uh, to, to, to take that, that fence away, um, make the bikeway uh, safer, more active um, for, for quicker uh, flow through, less congestion, a safer area, and again, open up the waterfront back uh, to all of us. Those are, those are the two things. I'm hopefully we can get these on an agenda soon and um, start attacking this like we've attacked the, uh, the heliport and other areas in the park that we know should be better, but, you know, can be a little challenging. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Uh, committee's questions or comments? I see two hands. I see Leslie. I see Alan. So, Leslie, please. No, I was just fixing my screen. <laughs> 
But, uh, but Brett, those are awesome, actually. That, those are a great presentation, like, great job. I agree with the bike lane stuff, everything, but anyway. I'll go to Alan. Um, good looking out, uh, Brett, thank you. The only thing, the cobblestone area, though, um, from my experience, is used very heavily by the production people. Uh, so that would be something you'd have to have uh, the trust tangled with them in terms of uh, their usage. Because when I walk there in the mornings, and this is, it, it's primarily during the week, so maybe the weekends, <clears throat> might, which might be a thought, maybe we can open up that area on the weekends. But during the week, you've got trucks all over the place. And plus, as things start to, you know, percolate, cars coming through and that. But uh, uh, maybe if we give Noreen a heads up, if she's coming to it, that she could maybe speak with the production people, um, maybe there's something that uh, they may be willing to do in terms of um, you know their access to that. Uh, but the other the 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 other spots are terrific, uh, uh, terrific looks at. It. Thank you, uh, Sally and Jeffrey. Please. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Brad. That's what, that was great. I mean, I, I am a big user of the Hudson River Park and I actually just never thought of those possibilities and they're great possibilities. There's something, I'm a big biker and I'm on the bike lanes all the time. And I, the, the standards that were put in after 9-11 to prevent cars from driving into the bike lane and bombs and all those other things, uh, I wonder if there is um, another way to position them so that they're not, it's like every, in certain places along the, uh, the Hudson River Park, they're almost every block. So you're biking along and particularly when the bike lane is crowded and you come to this point where we, you know, it's almost like a traffic jam where, you know, two or three lanes goes into this narrow one lane because you got to get through those things. I'd love to know if there was another way without jeopardizing the safety of the entire area to move those so they're not in the bike lane as an obstruction. That's my question. It seems to me that the question of the cobblestones and uh, stanchion placement is a uh, Noreen invitation to come talk with us. Do anybody think? Huh? Huh? You're, 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 you're not muted, speak. Okay, uh, well, in, in terms of transitions, most, a lot of them, from what I've seen, are where people cross from the east side going into the west side. And um, it's oftentimes a hardship for a lot of people with babies and dogs getting across because the bike is not necessarily stopped for pedestrians. So if the transients not only prevent the cars from getting onto the bikeway, uh, but they also slow bikes down, I think that's a good thing. Um, I have to believe, I, you know, I don't know the full purpose and intent, and you might be, very, you might be right, uh, Alan, but uh, I don't think it's the best solution. And I don't, I'm not an engineer or a park designer or any of those things, but uh, since I find it so objectionable, I don't know if other people do. I know David's a biker, Brett's a biker. I don't know if you find them as intrusive as I do, but um, if, if other people feel the way I do, I'd like to know if there's another way to configure that or do that and accomplish the same goal without it, without the, without it the way it is. Well, basically the purpose of the transients in those locations with to keep cars from getting onto the bikeway, as happened uh, two and a half years ago, uh, when people were run down. So, you know, uh, you know, I'm sure you can bring it up to to. Uh, uh, well, I'm only raising it. Come, but, uh, I'm yeah. only raising it now because of Brett's other point. If we're going to open a dialogue about things that we could think can make the um, Hudson River Park better. I'd like to throw this in the mix, that's all. Uh, I, yeah, no problem. To me that when social distancing is diminished, that we've done this in the past, that we need to take a walk there and all of us need to take a look at it together with some guiding eyes like HRPT. Uh, to, uh, that, that's a project, but it's a project that we can't execute. Well, you, you don't necessarily have to wait till they say it's all over because it, it probably won't be all over for a long time. 
uh, but you can safely go to the park and do an inspection. That, you know, people are working there. We're all going over there uh, regardless. Um, but um, I would like to put my plug in for the uh, for the heliport as things are starting to open up a little bit more and people are going to be using you're, it. You're, you're really eager uh, to talk about the heliport, and I don't mean to stop you, but I want to I want to get these points off the plate. It's not, oh, okay. We're not quite finished with this yet, or, or are we? I don't know. <laughs> I, I think the main idea was to introduce it and uh, encourage you all to go look look at these two areas with a fresh eye and just imagine what could be that's that before we talk about it with uh, HRPT. All right, uh, let's let's leave it on that note. We're, we'll we'll take a look and we'll have it. Uh, Brett is going to write a letter about the cobble about the the, the park and uh, the two areas that are now being mentioned: the cruise ship and Chelsea Pier. Uh, is uh, on the table for the, the discussion at this point. I just want to flag that the critical part to those uh, discussions with the trust can't just be with the trust, um, Chelsea Piers, and um, the cruise ship terminal, which is owned by EDC. But you know, I'm sure there's a Vornado discussion to be had, and we've had a bone to pick with them for a very long time. So these are very worthy causes, but they're they're not just with the trust in terms of the conversation. Right. Um, so wanted to flag that. Um, and then- More than just flagging it, they're very long-term issues. Correct. And then I guess just, I would go back to the fact that we could, we could mitigate a lot of this actually, but because of the letter we sent last month asking for an additional lane, um, for the Greenway actually would create a whole lot more space. So we're already on one track to try to get more space from one angle. And I think we should, that we're appropriately fighting from, from all sides. Um, so, which is a good thing. Heliport, Alan. Oh, I'm sorry, Brad. Uh, Brad, I think you should stop designing jury rooms. This is great, thank you. Um, I would like to throw on Brett's letter if we're talking about it. The roofs at Chelsea Piers, because we are an environmental committee, and th that's a massive space that we should be harvesting some energy on. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. Well, uh, just so that Brett's letter doesn't get too confusing, <laughs> he's, he's not putting he's not putting roofs on the track, and he's writing a letter about the track. Yes, uh, I just want to bring up the roofs. And and the roofs, uh, yes, thank you. I always appreciate what you're talking about some kind of solar. Keep bringing it up. Uh, we're now talking about helicopters. Ah, helicopters. So we wrote a letter. Backyard. We wrote a letter uh, late last year. Uh, Lowell wrote a letter, and you and my you guys wrote a letter to the city, we never got a response. I think um, uh, we do a response. I mean, the least they could do is tell us what they, uh, was some, there were some questions there. I'm sorry, I don't have the letter in front of me. There were some suggestions. There were some questions about operation there that they never got back to us. And as things start to um, get a little bit busier with helicopter use and cars coming into the heliport, uh, they have a very flimsy uh, operation there in terms of uh, keeping people on the bikeway and the pedestrian way um, for safety purposes. So I think it's something that um, needs to be looked at or at least questioned about getting some answers to what we wrote um, earlier. Uh, Lowell, do you remember that letter? Yeah, Alan's right. We never got an answer. I, Alan, as you know, part of it came up with the discussions with the HRPT working group about Pier 40 and Pier 76, you know, when we were talking about revenue sources and when that came up, um, we raised it then, but um, you know, we never got an answer. And the answer, if you ask Ms. Will separately is, if the state doesn't want it there, we'll close it because she's making money on that heliport and she counts on that revenue. Mm -hmm. So she's not going to take the, the trust is not going to take any action one way or another. Um, we would have to go after the state to get them to say to convince the state we don't want the heliport there. Well, I'm, I'm not I'm not so concerned about getting it closed down because that's another issue. I'm concerned more for the safety of pedestrians and bike riders. 
that cross the intersection with cars coming in off the highway who are going into the parking lot. That's 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 the, that was the per that was part of the issue that we wrote about. All right. No, I understand. Uh, so, we've yeah, got I think that needs to be addressed. Part of that part tonight. of that has to be addressed by transportation, though, um, because you're talking about access on and off the West Side Highway. Well, it's not access. They need to put. They need to. Put, what What happened was when we brought this to their attention and we showed them pictures about what was going on, and mm -hmm. he's crossing in and out of the of the lane without any. And, and the black car is sitting there idling and doing nothing. I remember right. your pictures, Alan. Right. So they started to they started to put pick people on on there with little red vests and trying to do a job of uh, directing traffic or holding up traffic because everybody's going at the same time and coming in. I think that needs to be repeated and ask them what is their, uh, what is it, what is going to be their protocol going forward with having staff on there to keep that intersection safe. That's all I'm asking. Okay, that we can ask the trust. Okay, that's almost an administrative letter, isn't it? Yeah, well, you know, it, whatever. It could, it could be. It could just be. Just to reignite it. That's you know. Janine. If you can pull out that letter and find it for me, we can send an admin letter tomorrow, and ask for a response. All right, I'll look for it. Thank you, Janine. You're All right, welcome. so I'll do that, Alan. I'll send it as an admin letter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Lowell. Uh, Leslie? Um, under new business. Is that okay, Martin? Go for it. Okay, uh, I know we are waiting, I think Jeffrey was telling me, uh, waiting for a presentation, but I think if it's possible, we can be more uh, proactive on shore power to the cruise ships. Um, I'm gonna do the environmental bent again. And uh, I, I, I know I've been working, um, or at least Brad's office has been working on that. They're looking for a New Jersey legislature sponsor um, because we're afraid that if we put this electric power, Jeffrey, you probably know, right? If we put no, this Leslie, there's no, um, the fault is, is mine. And frankly, um, we just need to be flagged to get them on the neck on July's agenda. Okay. And, and but I, I think them, even uh, them, I, I think there's stuff we could do proactively to uh, advocate for, going for the, sh the shore power. I just think it's, I mean, we're talking about cars polluting those, those cruise ships. One day is like, yeah, what was it? No, 35,000, totally you know, yep. idling tractor trailers. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I've been calling Con Ed and different things to see, like to get all these moving parts and working with Brad's office, but I don't know what this committee can do proactively other than wait for a presentation. I'm, I'm sure there's a few things we can talk to. I don't know if Maya's on, I don't think she is, but, um, uh, Jeffrey, would you repeat what you said about what's coming on our agenda? Sure. So um, just that, Marty and I, you know, you and I had the uh, call with EDC back what feels like 10 years ago, but it was the beginning of this year, pre-COVID. Um, and EDC had promised, as an agency often does, to get us more information than they did not. Because with that information, we then thought it would be appropriate to come to the committee. So it may just be time to bring them publicly before the committee. And if they don't have the answers to our questions, um, then they have to deal with that publicly. But Leslie, to your point, and I'm happy to hear you've been working with Brad's office on it, because initially we had suggested state legislation for um, cruise ship terminals across the state of New York, which would largely just affect the west side of Manhattan and Red Hook, um, should be required to have shore power. That to me sounds like a pretty straightforward letter, actually. Um, but at and the Red, same Red time, Hook did it, right? Red, I mean, Red Hook. Well, did Red it. Hook did it only for one partially. ship. Yeah, yeah, partially. Yeah, exactly. and I think the problem was about Brad's office was saying we have to talk to Con Ed, which we were trying to do about just grid power. Um, number one, and number two, I think looking for a New Jersey state legislature sponsor because they were afraid that if we put this on the West Side, the cruise yeah. ships would then just be like you know, we're going to go to Jersey and, and park there. Um, anyway. That's on Port Authority issues by partnering with New Jersey legislators. So it might be an avenue that we could um, find others to do so on. Definitely. Awesome. Thanks, guys. One of the things that Jeffrey and I heard was a version of we ain't got the power. Uh, and that, that was weird to me, but the, the, they, they knew it was heavy equipment and that it would require a lot of juice to how are those cities? And I guess to both Jeffrey and I thought, fix it. Yeah. Aren't they bringing in the power though, Marty, that we've had all these meetings with, where they're bringing the line in? And I kept saying, we kept asking that that's the, right. that's, the that's trust it. should get a deal on the power 
it's it's a massive line coming in right there. That's a gas line, Brad. It's a gas line. Oh, but they're they're putting a plant across the way, Lol, for the power. Yeah. It's too. But the, the line that would be coming across is a gas line. No, Lol. What we talked about was not a gas line. I think we're talking about yeah. two separate things. There are two separate things. There's the the power lines being dropped. Around. Yeah. Oh. It's 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 a power line from a gas plant in New Jersey. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. It's well, I gas powered, but it, it, then they're they're running the ca the electrical cables under. The so, bring, the, the, yeah, the I don't know. Right there. Yeah, but I mean that would be sure power for sure, but I don't know what kind of load it puts on and and whether or not those lines that they were thinking about dropping had the capacity. Well, we'd have well, to go back and look at that again. All, all of this, uh, where's the power coming from, uh, is, should not be used as an excuse not to do it. Agreed very much. I mean, if, how, if, if Nova Scotia can do it, I think, I think New York City can do it with power. So the question right. is, how do we move forward with that issue? And when, do we, and when do we put it on our agenda? Can we do it at a, at a, at a do, you, do you know, Jeff? I, I don't. I guess, you know, the, the, the governing agency of the cruise ship terminal is EDC. It's, ups, it's upsetting to me that they're the governing agency because we could all talk stories of how unfortunate it is that EDC has to be involved with, with certain things we want to be successful on. Um, you heard a presentation from them about this and it wasn't very satisfactory. I... To me, I think it sounds like let's go above EDC, which in, to me means we go to the state, which is why, Leslie, I'm happy to hear you've been working with Brad. Um, and we talked to our, not just we talked to Brad, but we talked to our assembly members also and see if there's state legislation they want to do and if they have connections in New Jersey. Um, that sounds like we should have Brad or somebody from his office come speak to us. I would be fine with that. Or, or, or do we need to direct them and encourage them to uh, sort of do that outreach. Well, the first thing you need to do is get Brad and Linda on the same page. Correct. Um, I think what happened, Jeffrey, was we were having a few like meetings, like little mini meetings, because um, there were members of the West 47th Street Black Association that was very active with this as well and with Brad's office. And I think once this started, it literally was meetings like maybe not even a month before COVID. And I think it all went to the, you know, so. But yeah. I think Maya is really into it. I mean, if we if we talk to Brad and Maya, we can figure it out. So let's move. Let let's do that. Uh, one of, one of the things that I had in my mind for tonight's meeting, we've just been doing. Uh, Jeffrey and I had a short conversation about what our future, what our agenda was for the next period of time, and that was to be one of the things that we talked about. And these are issues that concern us both in terms of uh, uh, Brad's solar collectors, Les Leslie's shore power. I don't want to say it's yours, Leslie. It's, it's all of ours. Um, uh, those are two good directions for us to be going to. We've got a track to talk about. Thank you, Brad. Um, and we've got some space adjustments to, they'll be harder and they'll be longer term, but everything else is a little bit more immediate. And, we can get some of these pieces on our agenda, Jeffrey, maybe you and I should talk. Uh, that's a good way to go. It, it, are there comments or changes or disagreements that somebody would like to make with what I just said? Hearing none, is there any other business, old or new? I'm just wondering how Colin has been able to stand so still and keep that smile on his face for like the last half hour. Yeah, he's virtual. <laughs> well, I, Colin, I was eat, Colin was eating dinner is what it looks like. Oh, I was eating, yes. That's why I had my video off. But I, I <laughs> he caught me. I did have, I wanted to second the earlier comment about the um, bollards on the bike lane. Um, they were put in there after, you know, the terrorist attack that I think happened in October of 2018 or 2017. Um, that, you know, I've almost hit my head on them several times biking. I mean, there is bottlenecks and there, it does create a safety issue in and of themselves. I think the DOT has heard from several advocates 
and community members about the placement of the bollards, it might be worth it to bring it up to them again because I think that, you know, they could look at it and see if there's any way that they could be repositioned or maybe, you know, smaller bollards could be placed down there. Um, it might help, especially it, we want it to, we want our position to be, you know, in accord with our recent call for a new lane on the West Side Highway. So it could be something to look into. I could also bring it up in transportation. I'm going to go back to eating now. <laughs> Thanks for your virtual presence. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I, uh, I, I, I just heard somebody uh, suggest that we adjourn the meeting. Did I hear that? You did, Mr. Co-Chair. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Welcome, members, it's so nice to have you. I want to meet you in person. Everybody stay safe, please. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everyone.